All right, so here's our learning objectives today. So we're gonna talk about building soil structure for tree roots. And then we'll talk about factors that affect tree water needs and move into effective methods for caring for trees, including um, proper irrigation. And then finally, we'll talk about drought tolerant trees, those that can tolerate water stress better and allow for effective landscape water conservation. But before I begin, I wanted to let you know about a new University of Nevada Reno publication on tree irrigation. This was um, funded by the Nevada Division of Forestry through a subaward from the US Forest Service. So it's now in publication. This publication will cover all of the material I'm going to talk about today, including the many tables and graphs that can help you implement some of these practices. So you don't have to take notes. Everything is in this publication. And there is a link in the chat box, Carrie tells me, for you to access this publication if you want to pull it up right now and, and look at it while we're going through this presentation. That's great. Um, otherwise, um, if you don't get to it and you forget about it, um, Carrie will also be sending that link in an email um, after today's talk. So let's start talking about the role of trees in our landscapes. And, and everybody knows some of the roles, but maybe you don't know all the things that trees do for us. So trees provide privacy, and of course they provide shade, but they also reduce water evaporation and decrease water runoff and protect us from dust and noise. And trees help us use less water and less energy. And of course, trees are beautiful, but Above all, trees are an investment. They're missed when they're lost, and it takes significant money to replace them and many years to get them to the size where they can actually provide these essential landscape services. So let's really get into how to take care of our trees so they can last um, the 50 or more years that they should in our landscapes. So a big stressor for trees, at least in Nevada these days, is the negative impact of improperly performed lawn removal on our landscape trees. And this problem has led to the decline of tree canopies in, uh, in Reno, Las Vegas, and probably many other urban areas in the West. So often little thought is given to irrigation and care of the tree, uh, the trees that remain in the landscape once the grass is gone. And so we end up with trees that fail a few years later after the lawn is removed. So in this photograph, the lawn around this blue spruce was removed and the irrigation was shut down to save water, which is a good thing. Um, unfortunately, this is what the tree looked like a few years later. So although lawn removal around trees does save water, and can really benefit trees when it's improperly implemented, it can have a disastrous effect on the most valuable plants in our landscape. So let's first talk about how to safely remove the lawn around your trees. So let's start by talking about what are the benefits um, of a lawn conversion. So we, we call this a lawn conversion. Some people call it a turf conversion. I've even heard it called a landscape retrofit, but it's defined as replacement of some or all of the turf grass lawn with trees, shrubs, and perennials. And it does have many benefits. It can reduce water consumption and waste. It protects water quality by reducing your use of lawn chemicals. It enhances the health of your soils when you mulch your soils with organic materials, and it protects pollinators and other wildlife when a diversity of flowering plants replace the lawn. So when done thoughtfully, removal of a lawn beneath a tree reduces competition from turf grass for landscape water. And so it saves water, but at the same time, it can also enhance the soil environment for tree roots. And now what in a, an effective lawn conversion is not. And this photograph shows what it is not. Um, a lawn conversion is not replacing lawn with hardscaping. In this photograph, you can see that the lawn around this tree was replaced with artificial turf. And you can also see the negative effect it had on this tree with all the, the um, bleached leaves and the tree bending over. It's, it's really under a tremendous amount of stress. 
I consider artificial turf actually a form of hardscaping because it doesn't decompose and it doesn't add to the organic component of our soils. So it really is a form of hardscaping. And artificial turf, along with rock and other hardscaping materials, can get extremely hot when exposed to the sunlight. In fact, temperatures of 120 to 180 degrees have been recorded above these surfaces. So it's really a big problem. In my opinion, the best use for artificial turf is in unplanted areas as an alternative to a rock mulch or other type of hardscaping. So let's talk a little bit more about landscape surface temperatures because these can have a, a tremendous impact on any plants in the vicinity. So many surfaces around trees especially can reach extremely high temperatures in the summer. And this can increase the tree's water requirements and it may have negative effects on the tree roots and on the soil microbiome, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So here are some examples. These photos were taken at Idlewild Park in Reno by our city forester, Matt Basil. And he took these photo or he took these photographs on a very hot day in Reno. It was 100 degrees um, in the summer. And he um, actually took temperatures at the same height about above different landscape surfaces. So here you can see the temperature above asphalt was on this day was about 158 degrees, really hot. Temperature on that same day above a turf grass lawn was about 95 degrees, so much cooler. So the first message here is planted areas are going to be cooler than unplanted areas with hardscaping. And so then he um, decided to look at different mulches. So what he found, though, is that temperatures above a rock mulch are pretty similar to those above, above asphalt. Here you can see it's about 154 degrees Fahrenheit. And then he moved some of the rocks a little bit and took the temperature just beneath at the surface of the soil, and it really didn't get much cooler. It's still at 132 degrees Fahrenheit. And then he even dug into the soil a little bit to see what the temperatures were there, and it still wasn't much cooler at 125 degrees Fahrenheit. So rock mulch is really not a great mulch for trees. But the surface of wood mulches can also be hot in the summer. And here you can see he measured a temperature of 145 degrees on this hot day in um, Reno. But when he moved the mulch away and took the surface temperature of the soil beneath, it had cooled down to 116 degrees. And then when he dug a little bit into the soil where the water absorbing roots are for trees, it was down to 82 degrees. So a much more conducive environment for our tree roots. So the bottom line here is that uh, it's better to use organic mulches around trees rather than rock mulches because they're so much cooler and it really creates a much better environment for the tree roots. So let's take a look at some organic mulch options for using around trees. And most of you are familiar with hardwood chips uh, and with shredded bark. We like to use shredded bark a lot in Reno because we get a lot of wind in the afternoon during the summer. And the shredded bark seems to, the fibers seem to intertwine with one another and it keeps them in place so they don't blow around like our hardwood chips sometimes do. But you can also use pine bark and pine needles as a mulch. The only caveat I would say here is to avoid these materials around trees that are planted in wildfire prone areas as they contain, uh, contain highly combustible phenolic compounds. So you gotta be careful with that. <clears throat> You can also use compost as a mulch, but you wanna apply that just a little bit uh, thinner layer than you with, would with other mulches. You only wanna use about one to two inches um, around your trees and plants to allow for good air and water infiltration into the soil because the compost can be a little bit more dense and it um, is not as easy for air or water to get into it. The other thing about compost is it de decomposes more quickly and will re need to be replaced more often. But one thing that we like to do, um, you can actually top a one inch compost layer with wood mulch so that you get 
from the compost, you get um, quick access to that decomposed organic matter, which can work its well way into the soil. But then you also get the benefit of the improved moisture control um, and cooling effect um, of the wood mulch. So some tips for using mulches, organic mulches, except for compost, you want to apply most of your wood mulches to a depth of about three to four inches. The mulch ring should reach out to the tree's drip line or even further if you can. And your mulch material should be kept about six inches away from the trunk of the tree to prevent any root and bark diseases from taking hold. All right, so getting back to um, effective lawn conversions, let's talk about ways to safely remove the lawn within the tree's root zone while at the same time improving the rooting environment for your trees. And one way is called sheet mulching. Sheet mulching is removing grass by smothering it with multiple layers of organic material. And here's a strategy, strategy that's commonly used. So first you wanna remove all the weeds in the area that you're gonna sheet mulch. So you can either hand remove them or use some type of grass selective herbicide um, uh, to kill the weeds. And then you want to mow your lawn, mow it close. So use the lowest setting on your mower and leave those clippings in place. That just adds to the organic matter, which is great for around trees. And then water that area thoroughly. And then lay down two to three inches of compost over the grass and lay cardboard over that compost. Just remember when you lay the pieces of cardboard, you wanna make sure to overlap them by about six to eight inches so that you can try to eliminate as much light as possible. So you don't get a lot, any of uh, your uh, weed seeds that might be in the soil. You don't want them to germinate um, through that uh, sheet mulch process. And then you wanna um, thoroughly wet that cardboard and add another layer two to three inches of compost, and then finally cover that whole thing with organic mulch. So you end up with something that looks like this. This is just a cutaway of an actual sheet mulching process. If it were actually um, working, you would have that um, sheet mulch lasagna looking structure all the way around the turf grass around that tree. But this is a cutaway just to show you what it looks like. So at the end of this process, then you end up with about six to eight inches of high quality organic matter um, around your tree, which if you keep it moist, will slowly decompose into a perfect organic substrate for your tree roots. So sheet mulching should be done in the fall, best time to do it because it's cooler then, and we're also more likely to get some natural precipitation at that time. And then by the following spring, the decomposed organic matter from your sheet mulch process will have worked its way into the tree's root zone, improving the structure of the soil. And many of you know that a soil with good structure will have excellent water drainage and really good water holding capacity. And it also then will provide a network of binding sites to hold onto the nutrients that are released from the organic materials as they decompose. And it will provide a carbon source to feed the microbes in your soil. We're gonna get to that. Again, some critical things to remember if you're gonna do some sheet mulching, make sure you overlap the layers of cardboard by six to eight inches to block the light and reduce weed seed germination. Make sure to water thoroughly after each layer you want, you don't want to be in any dry spots in there. You wanna have it nice and moist so it begins that, kickstarts that decomposition process. And then just like any mulch, you want to keep sheet mulch layers a few inches away from the trunk, as you can see in this photograph, um, and that will prevent any damage to your tree's trunk. Now, if that seems like too much work and some of us are busy and we don't want to spend that much time, there is an easier process called deep mulching. Uh, deep mulching is basically just applying a five inch deep layer of organic mulch around the root zone to smother the existing grass. And as with sheet mulching, deep mulch must be kept moist to allow for effective decomposition of the organic matter into the root zone. The only downside to deep mulching is that it's not really good at preventing weed seed germination. 
um, because it doesn't block light as well as a sheet mulching process. So you may have to hand pull weeds occasionally as they germinate through the, as they germinate and grow through that mulch. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the soil microbiome. I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but both sheet mulching and deep mulching around tree roots improves your soil health and it feeds beneficial soil microorganisms. Healthy soils, as you may know, are alive and populated by bacteria, fungi, protozoa, beneficial nematodes, insects, worms, and many other organisms. In particular, the population in soil of microorganisms, such as bacteria and fungi, is called the soil microbiome. So just as our gut has a microbiome, we're all talking about our gut microbiome these days, our soil also has a microbiome. So these microorganisms do play an important role in decomposing organic matter, and they release nutrients from the dead and decaying plant parts, and they convert these organically bound nutrients to plant available forms. So trees and other plants can take up those nutrients and uh, they help to increase the uptake of water and nutrients from the soil. Among these microbes, mycorrhizal fungi are particularly beneficial to trees in that they're symbiotic with tree roots. Benefiting from the carbon that's fixed by the tree during photosynthesis and providing in return an extension to the tree's root system for greater absorption of water and of nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen. These mycorrhizae, which are physically connected to the tree's water absorbing roots, extend further into the soil by way of a network of hyphal strands called a mycelium, which you can see in this photograph, two plants with mycelia attached to the water absorbing roots of those plants. In an undisturbed forest system, these fungal symbionts actually can transfer carbon, water, and nutrients from tree to tree, which helps younger and weaker trees within that forest system to survive. And you can apply those forest, those, those dynamics of forest ecosystems to your own landscape and to other landscapes by planting trees in islands or in groves, which helps to foster these below ground microbial relationships. So not only does um, planting trees in groves in groves improve the health of the tree's root environment and the soil microbiome, but it's also very water efficient because these tree roots can share water with one another and the tree canopies shade one another from the harsh sun in the summer. So they are under less stress. So this is a great stress reduction strategy for trees um, in areas, in arid areas where we have um, uh, less access to water. And the other thing about this is it's a great way to separate your trees from the lawn so that each can be more effectively irrigated. So that's a good segue to move into effective tree irrigation. So let's talk about tree irrigation, including the four aspects of irrigation scheduling, irrigation duration, frequency, timing, and distribution. So irrigation duration refers to how long you run your irrigation system. So the longer you run it, the deeper the water penetrates into the soil. Irrigation frequency refers to how often you irrigate. And how often you irrigate is determined by air temperatures and soil moisture levels. Usually um, wa warmer air temperatures indicate the need to water more frequently. And then irrigation timing refers to the time of day that you water, when, when you apply that water. And although it doesn't make that much of a difference when you're using drip irrigation, it's generally recommended to irrigate when temperatures are cooler and winds are calm. Usually that's in the morning or in the evenings. And then finally, and I think this is probably for trees, one of the most important, it's irrigation distribution. And it refers to the distribution of irrigation emitters around the tree's root zone. So you want to, and this sounds like, you know, 
it's, it's obvious, but you need to apply irrigation water where the tree's water absorbing roots are. Unfortunately, that often doesn't happen. So let's talk about where those tree roots actually are. So here's a line drawing of um, a tree in a landscape with the above ground part growing up. And then you can see at the soil line, the roots growing down. Um, notice that those roots don't grow down really deep like a carrot. They actually grow much further laterally than they do uh, deeply into the soil. Um, roots actually go down about 18 inches to 24 inches, and sometimes in older trees, even down to 36 inches into the soil. They can't go much deeper than that, mostly because there's just no oxygen deeper than that, and ro roots need oxygen in order to function. Um, one thing to mention about this um, graphic, if you look at those uh, red circles there, um, that shows you that there are no water absorbing roots within the first six to 12 inches of the trunk. And that's really important because a lot of times we see in our landscapes, irrigation emitters right up against the trunk of the tree, which makes no sense when you realize that there are no water absorbing roots near the trunk of the tree. So irrigation should really focus on the area covered by the blue circles on this graphic. This is called the critical root zone. And and this is where the, the majority of water absorbing roots are for trees. So you can see that root zone, those, those roots go down 18 to 24 inches, but they grow horizontally within the soil out to the drip line and sometimes well beyond that drip line or if they're in a large landscape or aren't blocked by any other structures in the landscape. And not, let's talk about um, how trees absorb water then. So water is absorbed from the soil and moved through the plants through a process called transpiration. And it's indicated by the blue lines um, on this uh, photograph on the right. Although trees absorb water through their roots, this process actually starts at the surface of the leaf. So as water evaporates from the leaf surface, Capillary action pulls water molecules from below, and because water molecules are sticky, uh, the process continues up the tree in a near continuous stream within the water conducting tubes inside branches, inside the trunk, until that suction reaches the roots and the water is pulled into the roots from the soil. So it starts at the top of the tree in the leaf canopy pulling water up through the tree from the roots. And that's really important um, to understand. Um, the process continues as long as there's moisture present in the root zone. And the process of transpiration is actually increased. And this makes sense now when you know that the process starts at the leaf surface, the process is increased and water loss is greater when the air is hot and dry and as wind blows over the surfaces of those leaves. And as we discussed earlier, the surfaces beneath the trees can also increase water loss from the leaves because sometimes they get very, very hot. So I'm gonna bring up one more term now here at this point, evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is a combination of two processes actually. Evaporation of a water directly from the soil, which is shown by the white arrows in this photograph on the right, and transpiration of water through the plants shown by the blue arrows. And the rate of evapotranspiration from landscapes is used to calculate plant water needs. So we're gonna move into that process right now, how you figure out how much water your trees actually need. But first I wanna talk about what happens when the tree root zone dries out before enough waters reach the branches. So branches that don't get enough water um, maybe because the root zone has dried out or you just haven't provided enough water um, or you just have very, very shallow rooting because the you're using your lawn irrigation for watering your trees. So branches that don't get enough water begin to die back, leaving bare leafless areas that are unable to process the sun's energy for growth. In other words, they can't photosynthesize. They can't make their own food. So these trees become less effective at providing shade 
and at cooling our landscapes. And it often goes on unrecognized early on because trees may not show drought stress symptoms for several years. So you may not know your trees under stress until it all, it's almost too late. But before we get into the irrigation part of this, I do wanna mention a little bit about soil drainage. You can't have effective irrigation if your soils don't drain properly. So it's a good idea before you plant a tree or really at any time if you're curious, but a good time is before you plant your trees to do a percolation test. And this is how you do it. And there's lots of different ways people do it, but this is easy. You can dig a 12 inch deep hole into your soil roughening the bottom and the sides of the hole to eliminate glazing of that soil so that water can infiltrate into the soil profile. And you also wanna soak the surrounding surface around the hole so that soil around the hole becomes saturated with water. And then wait 24 hours. After that 24 hours, refill the hole with water and observe how long it takes for all of the water to drain. If after 24 hours, again, the, you still don't, you still have water in your hole, that means you probably have drainage that's too slow for many plants, especially for trees. An optimal rate of soil drainage for most plants, including trees, is about one to two inches per hour. So a 12 inch hole should drain completely in six to 12 hours. So that's a perk test. So we can start now by um, talking about irrigating newly planted trees. So it's really important actually to irrigate new trees properly. It's critical to their root development and uh, uh, ultimately to the tree's longevity. So you wanna do it right. So you wanna start with a method that soaks the entire root ball. We use berms a lot. Berms are just build up, build up a soil around the root ball, usually beyond, a little bit beyond the root ball actually, so that you can get um, the entire root ball completely soaked in the area just beyond the root ball of your newly planted tree. And you want to continue to refill the water in that berm um, as it dries out. You don't ever want the root ball to dry out during this process when you're trying to get that tree established. And then it, as that tree begins to grow, and you can tell that by if you see top growth, on, gr top growth on the tree, you know that the roots are starting to grow into the soil. Your tree irrigation needs are going to change now. So when you see that happen, you want to break down that berm and then install a drip irrigation system. And when that tree is young, the, the rings of irrigation are going to be fairly close to this tree, still about six inches away from the trunk, but fairly close because the root system hasn't developed yet. But that tree is going to continue to grow. That root system will continue to grow into the native soil, as long as you're always keeping the wetting front just a little bit beyond where you think the roots are, and they're gonna grow mostly laterally like we showed in that line drawing earlier. Um, and so as you continue to get um, growth on this tree, you're gonna need to pull those irrigation rings further and further away, or maybe even add or put on a, a longer length of irrigation tubing around that tree so that you can get that entire critical root zone area. And here's a really important concept for you guys to remember. Roots do not seek water. They don't go around looking for water. They don't grow into dry soil trying to sniff out water. They follow the water. And so you need to train those roots where you want them to be by putting water in those places. And here's what can happen when trees aren't irrigated properly after planting. So in this situation, in this photograph, inadequate distribution of water early on to that tree's root ball caused a virtual pot to form with roots circling around the area where the moist, rich potting soil was, where all the moisture was when that uh, tree was first planted. And because these trees weren't watered properly when they were first planted, they didn't put water into the native soil just right around, probably right uh, emitters right up against the trunk, these roots had no incentive to grow beyond the area of that original root ball. 
um, and where that container was and where the moisture was. And because irrigation wasn't provided beyond that zone, the roots just kept circling around that virtual pot. So you need to not only provide water to the entire root ball, but you need to water the area just beyond it to entice those new roots to grow into and follow the water into the native soil. Okay, and then as your tree then continues to grow into maturity, um, your irrigation lines should be moved out and cover that entire critical root zone area. And this is where, again, that your water absorbing roots are going to be. Effective irrigation of mature trees should wet 60% to 75% of the area of the root zone down to a depth of at least 18 inches to 24 inches. So how do you know how much water a tree needs? And this is a good question and one we're gonna spend a fair amount of time um, exploring. So in arid climates where we get little effective precipitation during the growing season, how much water you apply depends on the difference between precipitation and the evapotranspiration rate during the growing season. And this graph on the slide shows that difference during the growing season in northern Nevada. So these numbers were taken in Washoe County, actually, and averaged over a period between 2013 and 2017. A similar pattern is probably uh, going to be found anywhere in the Intermountain West because we're all in an arid climate where most of our precipitation falls during the dormant season. Um, and not during the growing season and our sandy soils don't hold a lot of water from the dormant season into the growing season. So our trees are really completely dependent on us during the growing season for their water needs. So we really do need to pay more attention to how we irrigate our trees. So as and you can see on this on this graph, as our temperatures begin to rise, precipitation, which is indicated by the red line on this graph, um, falls to near zero in the summer, while our evapotranspiration rates, indicated by the blue line, rises to a peak, at least during this time period, to a peak of nine or 10 inches per month in July, our peak month, uh, uh, peak month for irrigation. And we base our irrigation on historical peak month evapotranspiration rates, which in Reno is 9.32 inches. It's always, uh, ET is always measured in inches. You can find your peak month evapotranspiration rate by visiting the EPA's WaterSense Water Budget Data Finder webpage and entering your zip code and it'll give you your peak month, the, the peak month ET rate for your area. Um, the webpage uh, is listed on this slide. Uh, it's also in the booklet, so you should have access to it. And it's really easy to use um, and really interesting to see how that peak month irrigation can vary even across a region or a state. I mean, peak month ET rate. All right, so we're gonna use that information then to calculate the water needs for our tree. And we use the equation that's shown on this slide to find out then the weekly water needs for your trees. Because most of the time during the growing season, you're gonna be watering trees once per week. So the equation is weekly evaporation, evapotranspiration, abbreviated ET, times water use factor, evapor or abbreviated WF, times the root zone area, times uh, 0.623, where the evapotranspiration rate, the ET rate, is measured in, in inches. But remember, we're using our peak month evapotranspiration rate. That's the evapotranspiration rate for the entire month. So you need to take that number and divide it by 4.3 to get a weekly evapotranspiration rate. And you plug that into this equation. And then the water use factor is shown as a decimal fraction of the ET rate. Um, and it, it's approxim approximation of the water efficiency of the plant you're irrigating. Um, and so that gets plugged in then next into the equation. And then the root zone area is the square feet of area within the drip line of the tree or within a grove of trees. 
And 0.623, that's a, it's never changes. That's a conversion factor that converts inches to gallons. So let's talk a little bit more about the water use factor. So water use factors for trees range from 0.5 to 0.8. Um, and let's talk about why. So some plants are more efficient than others in, in using water. So this graph shows the water use of trees versus the water use of turf grass based on a concept called the reference water loss, which is an, is an estimate of the water lost by a four to six inch tall cool season grass transpiring at its maximum rate. And that is noted by the red line on this graph. So that's what we're basing everything else on. And that's what's measured actually by weather stations. It can be measured daily. It can, usually it's measured daily. And then um, you can also access information by month or by year as well. The actual water loss then for plants may differ depending on the plant type. And so if you are a golf course owner, for example, you're going to want turf grass that's pristine. And so you're going to want to provide whatever you need to do to keep that grass, that turf grass area looking great. And so most of the time in golf courses, they're using 100% of the reference water loss. So that red line. But if it's just a home turf or a turf grass area around a business or commercial property, um, you don't really need to have a pristine landscape. So you can water at 80% of that reference ET. And so that um, uh, water use factor for that would be 0.8. And then you can see by the green dotted, the green dashed line below that, um, the water use factor for trees. Um, and trees use about, need about 50% to 80% of the reference water loss. Um, and so their water use factor is 0 0.8, 0 0.5 to 0.8. So trees are more efficient than turf grass at using water. Um, and that's really important. Uh, this difference, so this variability in the water use factor for factor for trees is species dependent. So it's really important for you to choose species that are more water efficient and get down towards the 0.5 water use factor whenever you can for trees. So that's when you select your trees. You may not have that option. If you've already got trees in your landscape, you just have to find out what the appropriate water use factor is for your trees. So then using the previous equation, I calculated weekly tree water needs in gallons. Um, and it was uh, based on the size of the tree, which was indicated by the diameter of the root zone area in feet. And then also based on the water efficiency of the tree. And I just chose the two extremes, 0.8 um, and 0.5. So 0.5 being the drought tolerant tree. You could set up a table like this easily for your area. It's just a little bit of math and you have to get onto the EPA's website and get your peak month ET rate. Um, just make sure you divide that by 4.3 to get a weekly rate because again, this is the amount of water a tree needs in gallons during the hottest part of the year. So it's a weekly water needs during the hottest part of the year, usually July and August. During the cooler parts of the year, you would irrigate the trees the same amount because you want the water to still go just as deep, but you would do that less frequently. And then when your temperatures exceed 100 degrees, like they do sometimes in Reno in the summer, you may need to divide the number of gallons by two and then irrigate that amount twice a week. So you're dividing up that irrigation to twice a week to prevent that um, uh, to prevent the tree root zone from drying out, causing dieback on your tree. All right, we've been talking about this drip line. Where is this drip line? So the drip line, which is shown by the dotted lines on this graphic here, is basically the area where if it was raining and you wanted to stay dry, you would get in between those drip lines um, because that's where the water, the tree is blocking the water. So it's basically the area then that defines um, the edges of the canopy, and it defines the area where most of your water absorbing roots are going to be in the root zone. Crown diameter is measured from one leaf canopy edge to the other. And again, the root, so root zone area here shaded in blue is defined by those drip lines. 
And the uh, equation you use to figure out what the root zone area is in square feet is crown diameter squared times 0.7854. So it's a pretty simple equation. Just uh, have to remember that 0.7854. And we uh, recommend using half inch diameter uh, irrigation, uh, professional irrigation tubing with inline pressure compensating emitters spaced either 12 inches or 18 inches apart. Um, the reason we uh, prefer that is because trees are long lived on our landscapes. And so we'd like our irrigation system to last a while as well. This tubing lasts longer and is less likely to be damaged by rodents than the quarter inch tubing, which is sometimes used. So I would uh, recommend spending a little bit extra money and getting a good irrigation line. A little bit more about inline drip tubing. Um, it comes in different lengths, usually 50, 100, 250 foot lengths are pretty common. Uh, the tubing has pre-installed emitters of various flow rates. Some common rates are 0 0.6 gallon per, gallons per hour and 0.9 gallons per hour, although depending on the company, it might be 0.5 gallons per hour and 1.1.0 gallons per hour. Um, and then the spacing can vary from six inches apart. The emitters are six inches apart all the way up to 24 inches apart. But again, for trees, the most commonly used spacings are 12 inches and 18 inches apart. And you would make that decision based on your soil texture. Um, and then you just wrap that um, irrigation line just in, outside the tree's drip line, in, just within and outside the tree's drip line connect it to a, a lateral irrigation line or a main line um, and separate those trees separately. So they're on a separate irrigation schedule on your irrigation clock from other landscape plants, especially from the turf grass, because trees need to be watered differently than turf grasses. And you place your irrigation line on top of the soil, not beneath it. A lot of people think it's only used for subsurface irrigation, but it can be used on top of the soil as well. And it works really well for trees. Just want to cover that with organic mulch to prevent too much evaporation of water. Use of this kind of tubing with those pre-installed emitters saves you a lot of time because you don't have to manually insert point source drip emitters into the line, which is really great when you're working with hundreds of emitters. So it's a real time saver. And the pressure compensation feature of these emitters assures that water is going to be delivered evenly throughout the, the root zone. So I, I, I consider it a pretty high quality um, type of irrigation system for our high quality trees and our landscapes. They're probably our most important landscape plants. Okay, so here's um, how you then determine an irrigation schedule. So now you know how much to water pretty easy to determine, to determine a schedule. So you're gonna to have to know a few things. So this, um, this table is set up with two different types of uh, textures of soil. And then it also goes on the left column by size of tree. So the emitter at the bottom of the table, look at this equation here, the emitter flow rate in gallons per hour multiplied by the number of emitters um, in your line multiplied by the number of hours you're going to irrigate should end up being the number of gallons you need uh, for your tree or for a grouping or a grove of trees. The length of the tubing that you needed is determined based on the size of your tree. The, uh, and that's shown on the left column on this table. The emitter spacing and the emitter flow rate, which is at the top of the table, are determined by your soil type. And the number of emitters used is defined by the emitter spacing of the line you've chosen and the length of your tubing. The longer the tubing, the more emitters you have available to you. So let's look at an example. So if you've got a 200 foot length of tubing with emitters spaced 12 inches or one foot apart, that line has 200 emitters. If you take the same length of line, but that lot, your, this tubing has 18 inch spaced emitters. Now you've only got 133 emitters. So again, you have to keep that in mind um, when you've determined your soil texture and you've chosen the type of line you're gonna use, that'll tell you then how many emitters you have. 
Um, and just for some context here, uh, clay soil, uh, we recommend 0.6 or 0.5 gallon per hour emitters uh, spaced 18 inches apart. If your soil is sandy, we recommend 0.9 gallon per hour emitters spaced or, or one gallon per hour emitters, depending on the company, uh, spaced 12 inches apart. So let's look at a quick example just to show you how this works. Let's say based on your calculations that your large tree requires 400 gallons of water per week and you have a clay soil. So in a clay soil, you're using 0.6 gallon per hour emitters spaced 18 inches apart. So you multiply 0.6 gallons per hour times the 133 emitters that are available to you within that 200 foot length of tubing and you get 80 gallons per hour. Now you know that you need to have 400 gallons going to that tree. So you divide 400 by 80 gallons per hour and that tells you you need to irrigate for five hours. So pretty easy to calculate um, a, a good schedule for your trees once you know the right information and how to use it. Let's talk about why different um, uh, soil textures require different uh, output emitters. So this graphic shows the size of the wetting fronts for emitters placed on soils of different textures. And the blue circle there shows you the, the size, relative size of the wetting front. So water moves quickly through a sandy soil, but the wetting front is relatively small. Um, and so you're going to want to use emitters that are spaced closer together to get good, good coverage of the root system. Looking at the other extreme, water moves slowly, but not, not very deeply through a clay soil. So the wetting front is going to be wider and you're going to use, need to use emitters that are spaced further apart. Now, because the water moves quickly through the sandy soil, they're prone to leaching. So you use higher output emitters and shorter irrigation run times. And because the water moves more slowly through clay soils, they're prone to runoff. So you're gonna use lower output emitters and longer irrigation run times. So here's some examples of irrigation of a single tree. Um, this is how you would arrange the irrigation line to achieve effective distribution of water. And remember, the most critical area to water is from six to eight inches or six to 12 inches away from the trunk out to just beyond the tree's drip line. In the photo on the left, I've circled the area. So this, this drip line here is just circled around the tree and it's got an open area at the end. I circled that open area. And because it's open, you need to cap it to maintain the pressure within that line so that the irrigation system works properly. In the photograph on the right, the irrigation is arranged in a closed loop, which is an irrigation design I really like because you don't have to cap it and that ir the irrigation pressure throughout that line is going to remain pretty consistent. All right, another practice that can really help to prevent water stress in trees is called hydrozoning. And hydrozoning is also a recommended practice for water efficient landscaping. So, for, so, so to save water, you wanna hydrozone. Hydrozoning is defined as grouping plants in the landscape by their differing water needs. So when you plant trees in groves, as shown on this photograph in the slide, that groves becomes that grove becomes a tree hydrozone. And this will allow you now to irrigate the trees in that tree grove on a separate irrigation schedule, makes it easy to do that from the turf grass in this landscape. Hydrozoning reduces stress on your trees, but it reduces stress also on all the other plants in your landscape because now you're irrigating for the rooting depth of those tree of those plants in the landscape. And let's look at uh, some of the differences in depth of rooting. So this slide illustrates the different rooting depths and therefore the different watering depths for various landscape plant types. So note in the middle column that tree roots are can be up to three times deeper than turf grass roots, especially with a mature tree. So trees need to be watered more deeply than turf grass. In the right column, you see watering frequency. 
which depends on air temperature. So the frequencies that are listed here should be um, accurate for most of the growing season. The frequency should be increased at, at the higher amount during exceptional heat when it's really hot in the summer and de decrease during the cooler times of the year. But really the whole point of this um, table is to show you that trees are irrigated more deeply and less frequently than turf grass lawns. And that's why they need to be in a separate hydrozone. hydrozone. All right, so now you know that and um, you're trying to uh, separate your trees and your lawn into separate hydrozones. But if you've had most many people water their trees just like they water their lawn, frequent and shallow, but now you've decided to put your trees separately deep and water them deeply and less frequently. But remember, now you've had trees um, in a lawn area which has been watered shallowly. So probably the water absorbing roots in your trees are very shallow as well and may only go down to a depth of six inches. So um, most of your tree water absorbing roots are gonna be in that six inches, that first six inches of soil. So in order to reap the benefits of a tree hydrozone, you need to wean your trees from the three day a week watering that we use here in the Truckee Meadows to once a week watering to encourage deeper rooting. And again, a tree with deeper roots is gonna be more resilient to environmental factors that increase that transpirational water loss like hot, dry, windy days. But you need to make the, the switch gradually. So if your trees were on a three day a week watering schedule, now you can put them on a two days per week schedule by dividing their weekly water needs in half and watering that amount twice per week. So do this for a month or two and then cut back to once a week watering. So now you've weaned your tree away and allowed for some deeper rooting of those trees so you can more appropriately water them and make them more resilient to drought. If during that process of weaning, the temperatures rise above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, go back to two day a week watering until normal, normal daytime temperatures resume and then you can go um, back down to weekly watering. So once your trees have adapted to their new schedule, and that you've got deeper rooting, you're gonna notice some things. You're gonna notice that you have less dieback in your trees and you're gonna have fewer problems with premature fall color. And that's a good indication that your trees are under much less water stress. All right, we've talked about irrigating single trees. How do you irrigate trees in a grove? So it's pretty simple. You just arrange the tubing in parallel lines to cover the entire length and width of that root system. Um, and then connect that line to an irrigation line, lateral line or to a main line. You make sure, wanna make sure those drip lines cover both sides of the tree, not just one side, because you will want that, the irrigation water to cover the full circumference of that rooting system. And then to calculate the area of that root zone, you just measure the area covered by the critical root zones of those trees. And then, um, Although this meth, uh, method works good in islands and in groves, it also can be used for trees that are planted in a row. So maybe you'll have trees along the side of your home, or maybe you've got a windbreak, or even in a parking strip, you can use this strategy for irrigating your trees in those situations. So let's like a, take a look at some practical examples of how, and I'm sorry, I'm running a little late, so I'm sorry, you guys, um, how this has been used in urban settings. So city of Reno recently committed to decreasing tree canopy loss to reduce the urban heat island effect as the climate warms. So our city urban forester, Matt Basil, has been experimenting with um, some of our methods for irrigating street trees. So these photographs shows you how, um, what they've been doing with street trees here in Reno. So on the left, you see trees planted in a median island with irrigated rings and parallel lines of inline tubing. On the right are trees that are planted ornamentally in a pedestrian area. One thing I want you to know here is the uniform, wet, uniform wetting pattern of these regularly spaced emitters. This is important because of the broad distribution of those irrigation emitters. These trees should develop broad, 
deep root systems, which can prevent wind throw during flooding, during storms, and it will minimize branch dieback during the hot summer. So it's a really effective way to irrigate trees, even right in the heart of downtown areas. Here's another example. This is a tree planted in a four foot by eight foot wide tree well. On the left is the schematic for that irrigation design. As this tree grows, because it's got a nice efficient system, it should be better able to maintain a canopy um, that provides shade to pedestrians and any parked vehicles. And finally, here's an example of trees in a narrow parking strip with four parallel lines of irrigation tubing. So trees that are in what would normally be a very stressful situation are a little bit less stressed now because they've got an effective irrigation system. All right, just a little bit more tree selection for drought tolerance. Um, plants have evolved a variety of mechanisms for adapt, adapting to arid conditions. For example, the reduced leaf size of juniper allows it to lose less water through its leaves. The deep rooting of gamble oak gives its roots access to a greater supply of water in the root zone, which makes it more resilient to drought. The blue colored leaves of Fremont berry, uh, blue, uh, barberry reflects high energy solar radiation away from the leaves, which reduces the leaf temperature and therefore water loss. And uh, common hackberry adopts a vertical leaf orientation, which minimizes exposure of the leaves to wind and direct midday sun, which also reduces water loss. And so you can look for these kinds of characteristics when you're selecting trees. But here's just a basic list of trees that are known to be pretty drought tolerant. In particular, I want to point out a few trees in here that were preferred by arborists throughout the Intermountain West during a survey we conducted a few years ago about drought tolerant urban trees. And these are their top 10 favorites. So Kentucky coffee tree, common hackberry, Washington hawthorn, honey locust, Rocky Mountain juniper, crab apple, fir oak and red oak, pine, uh, black pine and ponderosa pine. Um, some trees though are not very efficient and here's a list of trees that are not real water efficient and because of that they become susceptible to secondary infestation by bark beetles and borers, which can attack these weakened trees and cause premature leaf drop and sometimes even death of the tree. So ash, birches, some of the birches, elm, fir, locust, not honey locust, a true locust, some pines and spruce. Uh, in my opinion, the numbers of these tree species should be limited in drought prone urban areas so that we can maintain a healthy tree canopy and reduce the urban heat island effect. So finally, a summary of what, summary of what you've learned today. The microclimate around trees and their roots can raise evapotranspiration rates and increase tree water stress. But removal of lawn from around your trees can enhance the soil health um, minimize competition from turf grass and increase water and nutrient availability to your tree roots. Tree irrigation systems should be designed to provide water to a wide distribution within the tree's critical root zone and water stress can cause branch dieback and bark beetle and borer infestation in some susceptible tree species. And finally, trees that are selected for drought tolerance are less susceptible to water stress. So finally, I can answer your questions. And again, I apologize, you guys. I didn't know I'd go so long. When I tested myself, I was only 40 minutes, so I don't understand, but I must have been very wordy today. 